This is The Good Government Show. We need leaders who have life experiences because we always say that it is those who are closest to the problems who have the solutions. Good government is essentially being able to um, work with other elected officials. And, uh, that, and, and that sounds easy, but it actually is a lot more difficult. Um, it's about, you know, not focusing on the 30 percent that we disagree on, but focusing on what we do agree on and then doing the work, the hard work to actually move these things forward. That's how good government works, is that when everyone works together in a respectful way, that we can get things done. I do this work because of um, what I, how I grew up, you know, I felt like, you know, through all my life experiences, uh, the resources weren't there for me. I didn't understand that there were resources out there. So my job as leader of Oakland today is to bring the resources to the community and not wait for community to come to us. Welcome to The Good Government Show. I'm your host, Dave Martin. On this episode, we're meeting a mayor whose incredible personal story should inspire Americans all across the country, especially new Americans. She's Mayor Sheng Tao of Oakland, California. She was elected mayor in 2022, and as soon as she took office, trouble started. Their computer system got hacked and crime spiked. Clearly, Mayor Tao had work to do. But this is a woman who's used to hard work, so let me tell you a little about her. She's a Hmong. Uh, her parents fled Laos after the war in Vietnam. The Hmong people sided with the U.S., and once the U.S. pulled out, the ruling Communist Party largely tried to exterminate all of the Hmong people. Mayor Tao was born in California, and she's one of 10 children. Later, she had an abusive boyfriend who beat her, including when she was pregnant. She moved out, had the baby on her own, and became homeless, sleeping with her infant son in their car. But she got a job. She worked, and she graduated from community college, then transferred and graduated from the University of California at Berkeley. An internship with a city councilman led to a full-time job there, ultimately becoming chief of staff. She ran for city council, winning her first election, and went on to five years on the council. Her run for mayor had her finishing in the top of a crowded field. Oakland has always taken a back seat to its neighbor across the bay, San Francisco. Crime, housing, and jobs are all issues the city has struggled with for a long time. Lately, some trends are moving in the right direction, but not all of them, and there's still work to be done. And I talked to the mayor about all that. Since I first talked with Mayor Tao, she has become ensnared in a very public criminal investigation. In late June, FBI agents staged an early morning raid in her home. Documents were seized. The raid was part of an ongoing public corruption case. Mayor Tao has vigorously defended herself, claiming she's not the subject of the investigation, and she's vowed not to resign. To date, as of July 2024, she's not been charged with anything. We didn't get a chance to talk to her about this, but she's publicly questioned how a city mayor could be the subject of a surprise raid. She said she would have been more than willing to cooperate with investigators, but she was never given the chance, as she's maintained that she's not done anything wrong. Despite the challenges she faces, her story continues to be an inspiring story about a woman who overcame many personal challenges to become the mayor of Oakland. We will follow how this plays out. But first, let's go to Oakland and join me with my conversation with Mayor Sheng Tao. The Good Government Show is sponsored by OurCo. That means our community. OurCo has found a way to make government more effective. OurCo provides the OUR platform, and this is an app that blends in-person and digital interactions to connect people with their government their county, their town, their state. The OurCo app transforms meaningful conversations into reliable data. Uh, they can turn results into projects and programs the community has essentially already approved. It's sort of like a flash poll by phone, but without the call and in real time and wherever community members are, maybe they're at their house or their office or uh, where they're out just talking about local issues. Uh, maybe the choice is between putting in more local buses or expanding the bike lanes. Our code can get you an answer immediately. With OUR, you can engage your citizens or any group. Learn what they want and build programs and policies that advance your county, your job creators, your constituents. So visit OurCo.com, that's O-U-R-C-O.com, and learn how they do it and while you're there, book a demonstration. After you get done with this episode, hear more good government stories with our friends at How to Really Run a City, former mayors Kasim Reed of Atlanta and Michael Nutter of Philadelphia, and their co-host, journalist and author Larry Platt, talk with guests and other mayors about how to really get stuff done in cities around the nation. 
Check them out where you're listening now or through their nonprofit news site, the Philadelphia Citizen dot org slash podcasts. It is a pleasure to have uh, Mayor Thao on. Welcome to the Good Government Show. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Well, you you, you have been, uh, you are the 51st mayor of Oakland. You are the first, if I'm correct, uh, Hmong mayor of any American city. Uh, any large American city, yes. Of any large American city. You're a bit of a trailblazer then, I guess. Just a bit. <laughs> so uh, I've been uh, looking a little bit about what's going on in Oakland. Um, it seems like uh, you've had a rough start. Is that a fair statement? No, I mean, if you count um, having the worst kind of flooding, uh, you know, when I first came in, we had a, a flooding where we had to call an emergency. And then, of course, uh, there was the Internet hack. Right. So our IT department was hacked immediately. And so, yes, it was a, a bit of a rough start. A bit of a rough start. <laughs> so I'm going to just jump right in here. Um, one of the things that I, apparently is the big issue in Oakland is crime, although uh, it appears that crime numbers have dropped a little bit over the last uh, a few months. Um, there's still a, a, a both a perception and, you know, the reality is that Oakland does have a crime problem, but I see that you've got some initiatives going. Um, I want to just talk to you about a few of them. Uh, one is um, it appears that you've got 120 uh, California Highway Patrol officers that are now part of your police force and you've got some more foot patrols out um, and you've, you're hiring new, new police officers. What else is going on? And have I got that right? Yeah, you've got that right. You know, uh, prior to me coming in, what we saw immediately was like about every single month we were losing about 10 officers. They were either retiring or transferring. The majority were transferring to different departments. And so coming in, you already have a demoralized, you know, work staff, uh, whether it's OPD or other staff personnel throughout the city. Um, and then, of course, the pandemic happened. And so uh, as we saw with many different cities, crime went up. Uh, so we did an audit. We worked with Kaiser on an audit. The audit showed that, you know, we wanted to figure out what was the root cause? Has, has the reason behind crime changed or is it still the same? What the audit showed that it was very much still the same. So um, what I found is that uh, through the audit is that our flagship program, the ceasefire program, was sunsetted with the previous chief. Uh, he decided to sunset that program. And then from that uh, from that program, he used those resources for a different unit that did exactly what U.S. Marshals would do, which is go after people with warrants. And so it was kind of repetitive and redundant. The idea was that they were going to focus on closing cases. What we saw, the data showed that it actually they didn't actually close more cases. They gained more cases. And so uh, we knew that, that that method did not work. And so I shut that down. It was the VCOC. And I put all the resources back into our ceasefire strategy, which takes into account working with community, trusted um, messengers in the community, and tax Tackling those small groups of people, whether they're gangs or groups that are committing the crimes, the violent crimes, who are willing to pull that trigger, who are uh, or who are people who are ID as someone who will uh, have crime perpetrated against them. And so we do a lot of this work through our Department of Violence Prevention, where they will go out, find these high risk individuals and communicate with them every single day. You know, touch base with them every day, see them physically at least three times a week uh, and really try to get them into programming uh, and some intensive life coaching. And if they don't take these programming, then uh, they also understand they get put on notice that, um, you know, our officers are will come after them uh, when they commit their next crime. And we will have a full package of evidence to actually then off to the district attorney to charge. And so what we're seeing is that 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 has been working because. Uh, even though we're only hyper focused on the highest risk individual, it's the same 300 or 350 people that are also committing these property crimes, whether it's breaking into windows through our fencing rings, you know, stealing electronics and then sh uh, taking them to a fencing ring where they get shipped off to China um, or uh, robbing people or, you know, stealing cars. And so. That's why we see an overall uh, decrease in regards to crimes across the whole city. Have you seen an impact that Operation Ceasefire, or, well, I'm sorry, it's the Ceasefire program um, has made a difference? Operation Ceasefire, sorry. Has it made a difference what you've done so far? Oh, absolutely. It was an immediate difference. We received the uh, the finalized audit, you know, um, late last year in about probably December. We implemented it immediately, including putting in new leadership. We have Dr. Holly Joshi, uh, who used to work for OPD and then left to do gender-based violence. We were able to recruit her to come. We have new talent and 
our ceasefire strategy is definitely working. Our numbers correlate exactly for when we started implementing the strategy. We're being proactive and data driven now instead of just reactive and being response uh, driven in regards to after a crime happens and then OPD shows up. We're being proactive and actually intervening before crime even happens. Tell me a little bit about this uh, street ambassador, these community ambassadors. Um, apparently, you've got a grant for this. And how is this helping fight crime? Yeah. So when we talk about our ceasefire strategy, that's only one component. I like to say our public safety approach is comprehensive. So what does that mean? A part, a large part of that is the visibility of actually having people on the streets. And so our street ambassadors are tied to our different business corridors. And essentially, each of the different business corridors, um, they and each of the different ambassador groups, they operate differently depending on which area they're in. So these are, it's not done through one company or one organization. It's multiple organizations because within the city of Oakland, we have different hubs, different parts of Oakland that are that have different needs. And so having these ambassadors go out, uh, some of them are, uh, you know, majority of them are making sure the streets are clean, talking to the merchants, talking to the customers who are shopping in the area. They're wayfinders, you know, um, information giver. They also have a direct communication to our macro program, which is our non-emergency response program for mental health crisis, so that we don't have to call upon our officers to show up to the scene. And so uh, this grant money really helps us expand the ambassador work that we currently are doing, including the ambassadors go out and uh, talk to people who are unhoused and try to get them the resources that they need, whether it's um, uh, permanent supportive housing, temporary housing, if they so choose to take those options or just, you know, figuring out how to get them to uh, a shower if that's what they need. Well, it is the good government show and we'd like to hear about good projects that work. And I would gather that one of the good things that comes out of this street ambassadors is you get more citizens involved in buying into what it is you're trying to accomplish, right? Absolutely. You know, um, we all know that right now our, you know, local county jail and local county hospital hospitals are, you know, impacted, highly impacted. And we can't or we're, we're not going to be able to arrest our way out of this, you know, especially arresting people for um, because of poverty. Uh, what we're trying to do is really give them the resources so that we can really tackle the root causes. And um, I'm really happy that uh, and along with the good governance part of it, you know, and with you stated that we worked with CHP. Absolutely. That's a part of it. I think that a lot of the people uh, a lot of people have said, look at this mayor, you know, she's obviously not doing a good job because the governor had to come in and send CHP. Actually, we've been so used to not having good government, which is everyone working together, that that's how people feel. This is exactly how good government governance work, right? It's me working with our state representatives, with our governor. You know, it took all of us, the senator from the senator to assembly members, myself and the governor to come in and say, you know, uh, let's do this work together. And so what you're seeing is something that hasn't been done in a while, which is, you know, all of the arms of government working together not saying, well, that's not my lane. That's not what I do. No, it is what we all do. Everyone, you know, in the state of California, including all of Oakland residents, are constituents of the governor. This is what we do. We share resources when when someone needs it. And I know you came under a little bit of fire for a delay in hiring a new police chief, but now you have a new police chief. What difference has that made? You know, it makes all the difference in the world in the sense that our department, uh, you know, they have stability in their leadership. Um, the getting new talent and getting a new police chief was a huge hurdle. We have a, uh, in a police commission that has full authority around vetting all of the applicants. I don't actually get to vet the applicants <laughs> first. Yeah. And then they choose between at least three. They can give me the whole list or they could give me, but, or, but they are re, uh, required to give me at least three names. And so the first round, they gave me the three names, including uh, the, the previous chief who I just fired. Uh, right. They put his name back on the list. And so Not there a was a lot of yours, is she? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, not much. But yes. uh, but at the at the end of the day, you know, um, it's unfortunate that uh, people were playing political games with with the hiring of the chief, and so I was also very frustrated that we couldn't get one sooner. But now we do, and he's great. Chief Floyd Mitchell comes from Lubbock, Texas, and um, he's coming in. And rank and file police officers are excited to be working with him and under his leadership. So I talked a little bit about you uh, when I introduced this before you came on. 
quite an impressive uh, background for yourself. You you are the child of uh, refugee parents uh, from Laos. Uh, you went to community college, got yourself through as a single mother, uh, a victim of uh, some unfortunate, uh, I guess, spousal abuse. And 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 yet uh, you went to Berkeley, graduated and uh now you're the now you're the mayor. Uh, after other stints in, in politics and government, um, what does that experience bring to you in the in the role you serve now? You know that experience uh, means everything to me. Did I get me, it right? Know? Did I get your history right? Yes, you did. You did. You know, um, I think that it's an, I think it's so important that in these leadership roles, especially when we talk about good government, that it, we need leaders who have life experiences because we always say that it is those who are closest to the problems who have the solutions. And so with that being said, you know, for me going through these different, um, you know, um, things in my life, you know, being a DV survivor and a single mom, being homeless, you know, my son and I, we lived in my car and the couch surf because we couldn't pay first month, last month and deposit. I mean, that's the majority of the world. You know, that's the majority of people who live in the United States is trying to figure out how do I pay rent and to feed my children. Um, and at the same time, you know, um, have enough time and have access to resources. And so um, having these lived life experience you know, this, this is how I lead. This is, uh, this is why I'm unapologetic about, you know, making sure I represent the, our working families, because if we lift up our working families, then we are all lifted. I know that you recently attended a conference of mayors event in Washington to advocate for uh, better housing. What initiatives have you started with uh, trying to get people into homes? Yeah. So it's a bipartisan issue. And so uh, the conference of mayors where it's, you know, where it, it, it's bipartisan. So you have Democrats and Republicans, and we agreed on three things that we would advocate for making sure that the veterans formula, when you build out affordable housing for veterans, um, that right now their benefits that they receive as veterans count against them. And so we want to say, you know what, you need to not uh, count the benefits that they received because they are veterans as part of their income. You know, otherwise the buildings that you're being, that are being built out for veterans, the veterans don't even qualify for. So that's one. Another thing is we're we're advocating for place-based voucher, project-based. And so instead of when we talk about Section 8 vouchers, instead of saying, here's a voucher, go find a house, uh, it's we build a housing and the voucher is tied to that project. So whoever lives in that uh, is already deemed as qualified. And if they are in that housing, then the voucher stays there with that project. We are obviously also advocating for uh, making sure that there are also tenant-based housing. And so the traditional voucher uh, vouchers and increasing the number of vouchers that are being received in each city. Uh, I just want to mention this. Um, I am a New Yorker. Parking is a constant problem. I love this five after five program. You have five dollar parking downtown. Is that helping uh, bring people into the city? It really is. You know, the city of Oakland, we are seeing that we are bouncing. Our downtown is bouncing back a lot quicker than our neighboring Bay Area cities. And this is a part of it. A part of it is we're making it more attractive for people to come. Five after five, you can park your car inside of a city garage. That means that when you come out, your windows won't be broken <laughs> uh, and it's only $5. And so you can, um, you know, wine and dine and, and have all the entertainment and then come back and make sure and know that you have a vehicle to drive home. Uh, we Did are you call the mayor of New York city program. and explain this to him and talk to him a little bit about it <laughs> next time you see him? <laughs> That would really be helpful. Uh, I, I, will, I will bring that up. I please, tell you. I please, please, please. <laughs> um, all right. We have a we have a good government show questionnaire. Uh, you are a chief of staff in, in city government. You are a uh, city councilwoman. Now you're mayor. Define good government. Good government is essentially being able to um, work with other elected officials. And, uh, that, and, and that sounds easy, but it actually is a lot more difficult. Um, it's about, you know, not focusing on the 30 percent that we disagree on, but focusing on what we do agree on and then doing the work, the hard work to actually move these things forward. Uh, that's what good government is. And, you know, I'm hopeful that we can continue this kind of good government here in Oakland, working with our state partners, our federal partners and the community. That's really what it is. Uh, the community has to be a part of it. You know, if anything okay. that you do, you have to make sure that you have community support and uh, community leader, leaders buy in. Um, and so I do a lot of work in the community to ensure that uh, this is what the uh, the call for is and uh, the call to action is. And um, and that's how we get things done. You know, we have coming online 480 flock cameras, which is the high tech cameras that can really hone into different 
specific details of vehicles and what have you. Um, in a progressive city like the city of Oakland, that would have never happened under a, another leadership. But under my leadership, it was a, we were able to get the work done because, again, I can uh, speak to multiple sides of the community. Uh, and, you know, when you have a trusted messenger, um, then things work a little bit more smoothly. And so that's what I pride myself on is being direct and honest, whether I'm talking to community, other uh, elected officials or uh, city staffers, county staffers. Um, and what that has proven is that that's how good government works, is that when everyone works together in a respectful way, that we can get things done. How do you judge your success? How do you know if you've done a good job? What do you look for? Yeah, you know, I look for whether I'm um, creating a better quality of life than uh, what it was when I first came in. And right now, uh, it looks like we're on the trajectory of, um, you know, of hitting that mark. But of course, I always push myself, you know, nothing is good enough until there are no lives lost. And through our, you know, the re-implementation and relaunch of our ceasefire strategy, we know for a fact that we're saving lives. And uh, for the first time ever, um, I am actually starting uh, a mayor's human trafficking council that's led by survivors. So, you know, we are also making sure that we're tackling this huge topic. We all, you know, everyone knows that Oakland is one of the major hubs for human trafficking and yet nothing's really been done about it. And so we're going to take that on and try to help with that. Again, um, another point of success is our homeless population, you know, making sure that we're getting people housed. We had, you know, our version of Skid Row in Oakland was Wood Street. And in the first three months of being in office, we were able to um, break down the, uh, you know, the encampment and get everyone, 100 percent of those who wanted housing. We got them into housing or got them on their way to housing. Um, and it was 85 percent of the people that lived there. And there were hundreds of people uh, to Took services. The others decided not to. And so we can't force them. Um, but anybody who's wanted services received them. And so, you know, we're headed, I believe Oakland is headed in the right trajection. And, you know, we're, we are turning that corner and turning that tide. However, um, of course, uh, m media, you know, gets a lot of the negative news, uh, but there's so much positive happening in the city of Oakland. Well, that's what we're trying to talk about. However, I do have to go back a little bit. Um, there are a lot of people who are unhappy with your government. There is a recall movement. I have a two part mm -hmm. question. Um, what would you like those people who who are you know trying to have a recall? Um, what would you like to tell them? And secondly, um, how do you manage through something like that? When you know you go to have a press conference and people shout you out and you have to mm -hmm. cut it short? You know, it, it's democracy, right? It's democracy. Not everyone is going to agree with my leadership. Um, you know, I... I, I think that it's unfortunate that um, I I feel like I wasn't given a full chance. So, you know, I just got into office, you know, a few months before the recall was um, actually being put together and launched. And so, you know, um, I, you know, at the beginning there, the people that were leading the recall were people who ran against me and lost. And right, so, I saw that. Yeah. And so it, it's just unfortunate to have this kind of divisiveness and to have it be covered as much as it has been, because for just that, those, you know, it might be loud voices, a minimal number of people with loud voices and know how to call the press and know how to file recall petitions or what have you. And so, but that's a democracy. And I would just ask that they give us an opportunity and to really measure my leadership through the different successes that we've had thus far. I've only been in office for less than a year and a half. Right. And so, um, you know, um, but with that being said, we're just getting started and I'm going to continue to focus on my job, which is, you know, a clean air and safer Oakland. So we're working hard hard every day on the safer part of it. And we're going to continue. It's not good enough. You know, it's never going to be good enough for me. And so we're going to keep continuing to keep pushing and demanding more. And at the same time, you know, our streets are, uh, have been pretty dirty for the last decade that I can remember. So we're going to go out and do some basic cleaning. Um, and that work has already started. As an elected official, what would you like people to know about how government works? I think that it's incredibly important that people, um, that everyone gets educated around who does what. So the county here in the city of Oakland, uh, we do not have a public health department or social services. That's all done at the county level. Okay. And a lot of the t a lot of times people don't even know what the county representatives do or they don't know who their county elected officials are. And so we're trying to do that kind of work around educating the community. But I would just say, you know, understand better what each arm does, because 
our officers can arrest someone, but we turn the evidence right over to the district attorney's office. Okay. And it's up to them whether they charge you or not. Where do you get your news from? Um, I get my news from different uh, methods. You know, I read the paper, I watch the media, but it, it, that's a really interesting question for me because I am a uh, an elected official. And so, you know, I have to pay attention to all of the things that uh, other people may not, including next door, including uh, social media, you know, uh, Instagram and and the traditional methods of getting our news. And then you you know, but I would warn people that um, when getting your news, do your research just because, you know, we're in a weird time right now where, you know, so long as you say it over and over, it becomes facts, even though it's not. And so I would just suggest that everyone uh, do their own research and dig deep. Um because okay. it's not like how it used to be. And by the way, I will not take points away for not saying, and I listen to good podcasts. Um, <laughs> and I listen to great yeah, podcasts. Yeah, too little, too late. Um, <laughs> so who's your political hero? Is this, is something, this is, did you want to be president? Were you president of your high school class? Is this something you always saw yourself doing? No, it's not something I always saw myself doing. Actually, uh, the, the secret of it all is that I'm actually an introvert. Um, and so, okay. <laughs> um, but you know, I, I do this work because of um, what I how I grew up, you know, I felt like, you know, through all my life experiences, uh, the resources weren't there for me. I didn't understand that there were resources out there. So my job as leader of Oakland today is to bring the resources to the community and not wait for community to come to us. OK, do, um, you, have, do you have a political hero, though? Uh, I don't you know, I have a political hero, but my mom just passed away. And I would say that she's my political hero. OK, you know, she escaped genocide and um uh, as a widow mother and survived and raised 10 kids. And um, you're one of has, 10. Yeah, I am one of 10. And so she's the strongest person that I know. And she's my hero of all types. Okay. I have never been to Oakland. I'm sorry to say I've been to San Francisco. Uh, if I'm coming out there to visit, uh, I want to know where I understand you don't cook. So where are you, where are you taking me in Oakland? What are we having? Uh, I know your, your Loatian background. What are we, where are we yeah. going and what are we having? Yes. You know, there's so many great spots. So when you come out here and yes, yes. I don't cook, uh, when you come out here, there's so many great spots. Uh, Venetian cafe is like this little, uh, it's, it's literally a house in, in, in a neighborhood, but it is a restaurant. And so that's really good Laotian food. Uh, we also have, um, you know, uh, farmhouse Thai, which everyone loves. There's always long lines. The decor okay. is amazing. Uh, Bombetta. Bombetta is a uh, Latina run restaurant. And right. it is one of the possible, I think they're running for a Michelin star. And so there are just many places to eat. And I would, and, you know, to the, to the taco truck. You All know. right. Now, well, yeah, I, I, so, I, if I'm eating with, if I'm dining with you, I want something in the way you should do. Are we going to your sister's house? That's someone who can cook. And what's oh, your yes. favorite dish? Yes. You know, uh, my favorite dish dish is co it's called cup one, which is and um, uh, it's basically like a curry soup with noodles okay. and uh, with rice noodles. And it has quail eggs in it. Um, you know, it has condensed milk in it. And so it's a little it's a little just a little slightly thicker, uh, but it's really tasty. And it's a little bit of a kick of spice. Uh, my sister does cook it really well, but there's also great restaurants here that. Uh, that have it. <laughs> All right. This is called the Good Government Show. We like to bring it back to good government. Give Give me an example of a good government project that you're excited about. I don't want to put words in your head, but I read something about Oakland Fresh um, or tell me something you're excited about. Yeah. So Oakland Fresh is something that we are launching and that is us bringing all of our department heads into the community to fix things all at once, meaning if there are sidewalks that needs fixing, we'd fix that immediately. Uh, if there are crosswalks that need new paint jobs, we will do that. You know, uh, cleaning the street, illegal dumping, we're picking that up, but we're only going to do it with community. Um, so that's everyone from the public government sector, from whether it's our electricity personnel, PG&E, to cable personnel, big businesses, and then the residents. And so changing the culture inside of the city of Oakland and changing the culture outside with community is how we continue to keep Oakland safe and clean. And so uh, for me, that's what gov good government looks like. Uh, last question, I gotta ask this one. Oakland A's, any chance they're mm -hmm. gonna stay? You know, uh, there's always a chance so long as there's not a shovel in the ground. And the last I checked, there's no shovels there's in the no ground. There's no shovels. So maybe one more time. Uh, yeah. Mar Marithal, uh, it has been fantastic talking with you. Uh, so much more I'd love to chat with you about. We'll have to save that for another time. Uh, you're a year and a half in. You've got a few more years to go. Good luck. I hope it goes better for you. And uh, thanks very much for doing this. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. 
Where do you get your news from? Where do you get your state and local government news from? Because that's getting harder and harder. And it's essential to stay updated with your community. And it's becoming increasingly important to know what's going on in other cities and states because they're likely facing challenges that you're grappling with too, or you're going to face eventually. That's why we'd like to welcome our new partner, Route 50, to the show. Route 50 is a leading online publication covering state and local governments across the country. They've written about states protecting themselves against the rise in cyber attacks, counties using AI to better support citizen services, local responses to crumbling infrastructure and extreme weather, and much, much more. There's a lot there. It's a one-stop shop for issues affecting state and local governments and their residents. That's you. That's all of us. Do yourself a favor and go to Route50.com to see the topics and solutions they cover and learn what other people in government are doing. They also deliver a daily newsletter called Route 50 Today. I see it in my inbox every morning. I check it out and you should too. Thanks again, Route 50. We're excited to have you on board and being a partner here at The Good Government Show. What is it that county government does? That's the question county commissioners get asked the most. And the simple answer is everything. On The Good Government Show, we're so lucky to have talked with so many county commissioners and other county officials that have shown us how effective county government is. County government dates back to, get this, 1634, making it one of the oldest forms of government in the United States. Think about it. Roads, highways, hospitals, schools, recycling, law enforcement, water, sewers, and most of the county, those services are maintained by the county, that's county government. The National Association of Counties represents all 3,069 counties across the USA. NACO helps county government work better together through things like sharing best practices. When county government works well, well, that's just good government. I could have talked to Mayor Tao for hours. I don't know if you would listen that long, but she's certainly a dynamic person with an incredible personal and professional story. Turning a city around is hard, and harder when the opposition is calling for you to be removed from office. And the opposition is not necessarily doing it for all the best reasons, but this is not deterring the mayor. She said she's going to keep working, keep speaking up, and keep speaking to all sides in government to get the work done. And that, she says, is what good government is all about elected officials working together. And we like that here on The Good Government Show. Well, we'll be following Mayor Tao, and we'll talk to her again. That's our show. Thanks for listening. Please like us and share us with your friends and review us right here where you're listening now. And check out our website, goodgovernmentshow.com, for extras. Join us again for another episode right here. I'm Dave Martin, and this is The Good Government Show. The Good Government Show is a Valley Park production. Jim Ludlow, Dave Martin, that's me, and David Snyder are the executive producers. Our show is edited and produced by Jason Stershik. Please subscribe, then share us, and like us, and review us. That's the best way to make sure we're able to keep telling these stories of our government working for all of us. Then listen to the next episode of The Good Government Show. Good Government Show.